Well, I want to welcome you all to uh, what I think is going to be a very special podcast, or it could be a series of podcasts, because on September 23rd, I made a presentation with the help of Chris Pedersen, who is our director of, uh, of research, and Chris, hold your, there he is, and, uh, and Daryl Balls, director of analytics, he's the only guy left, and we made an hour and a half presentation about selecting the best one, two, three, or four fund strategy. The whole idea of that presentation was to focus in on some simple, what we call no-nonsense portfolios that virtually anybody can do if those particular kind of funds are available in your 401k. So the idea is to simplify, simplify, simplify. And, uh, and, and Daryl and Chris have just done, I think, an amazing job of helping us pare this down to give you what we consider to be one of the finest likely returns for the unit of risk and to be able to do it easily. So what we're doing now is during that presentation, we were bombarded with questions. And we had about 75 to 100 questions that didn't get answered. Now, I'm not guaranteeing that we're going to get to everyone specifically, but we're going to try our best to focus in some major areas and, and, and to be able to uh, give you a sense of some of those broad questions that you asked. So let's talk about, start with what I think is the basic reason for having even done that particular uh, uh, presentation. And that is that we wanted people, one, to understand you don't have to have 12 funds in your portfolio to get a good return. And that the asset classes you actually select for your portfolio is going to make a huge difference in what you're likely to have at the end of your career of investing. And you'll see some, some specific returns. Now, we are only looking back 30 years and we'll be very careful to make sure you understand that there are some limitations only looking back at those particular 30 years. And we also wanna focus on risk and make sure that you'll have a good feeling for what the different risks are for these different portfolios. And what made me feel particularly good when I saw all the numbers is it truly looks like we ought to be able to squeeze a better return out of a lot of these no-nonsense portfolios without having to do anything very fancy. And one last thing, and it is the big surprise that I got out of putting this whole presentation together. And it was with the help of Daryl Ball's uh, research on creating what you'll learn about if you don't know about it in a few minutes, the telltale chart. And what the telltale chart, the bottom line that it taught me is that when we leave the safety of the, 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 the most common, most uh, uh, popular mutual fund or asset class, the S&P 500. When we leave that and we try to get a better rate of return, it is really in some ways unsettling how, how long sometimes we have to wait in order to break even. And I don't mean break even in return, but there are long periods of time that the S&P 500 will outperform these different kinds of strategies that we'll be showing you. But with patience, from everything we know about the past, there should be, should be that premium. So Daryl is the one who did all the legwork here in the tables that we used when we made the presentation. And uh, uh, Daryl, I, I want to turn to you now and talk, if you will, about those the tables that you developed 
and and how you put those together. We had a lot of questions about about those tables. So uh, would you take a few minutes and go through them? Yeah, I'll do that, Paul. What we've got here is uh, table one of Paul's presentation, and it kind of lays the groundwork or gives an overview of all the different portfolios that he covered uh, during the, the presentation. There were three one fund portfolios, uh, the S&P, the total U.S. market, and the total world market. And there were four uh, two fund portfolios, the uh, total international and total U.S., which is the equity side of the Boloheads three fund portfolio. Could I uh, interrupt you back there, Daryl, just one sec. Yes. That, that, that could be confusing to people because I probably didn't set it up right. We're talking about two fund portfolios but it says three fund uh, equity only Bogleheads port, uh, portfolio. What we did in these portfolios is we threw out any of, fix, of the fixed income that somebody might have recommended because we felt the only way to truly get a comparison between these different portfolios was to look only at the fixed at the equity portion. And then, of course, you as an investor could decide how much fixed income you ought to have. So that's why it says three fund, but it's two fund. Sorry, Daryl. That's okay. And, um, and it's actually 70% U.S. and 30% international. Um, the, other, the total U.S. Uh, and 30% small cap value tilt and the total world uh, with a 30% small cap value tilt are uh, sort of modeled after some of Fama and French's work. And then uh, Paul has talked about a, a US all value portfolio also, that's 50% large value, 50% small value. Uh, the three fund portfolio is actually the equity side of Rick Ferry's four fund or core four portfolio. <laughs> so it's like the Bogo heads again, it's minus one minus the fixed income component. It's got 60% US market, 10% REITs and 30% international. And then there are the four, fu four fund portfolios. We looked at three of those and they're all equally weighted in terms of, of their asset class allocations. The first one is the US four fund, which is 25% in uh, a large cap blend, the S&P 500 in index, 25% uh, in the large cap value index, 25% in the small cap value index, or small cap index and 25% in the small cap value index. Then there's a, the world or the international four fund, which is also called the Trev H or after the name of the uh, Bogleheads user who, who sort of popularized it on the Bogleheads website. And it's 25% uh, large U US large cap blend, 25% US small cap blend, 25% international large value, and 25% international small cap uh, index. These are all indexes. And I think it's uh, worth mentioning that basically it is accessing the same four asset classes as the four fund uh, Merriman strategy. It's just that it's picking up two of them internationally um, yeah. and rather than having them all be in the US, but they're all there. Yes, that's true. And then there's the all, all value worldwide portfolio, which is uh, large and small value in both international and US. And these are all indexes. We didn't use any particular real uh, existing funds, specific funds. And, and that was in part because we wanted to look at just what the results were as a result of the asset classes involved. We didn't wanna to have to deal too much with whether their management costs were, were uh, different, whether the tax environments might be different depending on where they were located or anything like that. It was just, just to assess how the different asset classes performed relative to each other. The one difference to that was that we did take out uh, a representative expense ratio because some of these asset classes are more expensive to actually create than others, uh, regardless of how the fund is managed. And so we used uh, expense ratios over here that were uh, analogous to the expense ratios that are actually from uh, Chris's work on the best in class funds. Uh, we, all the portfolios, when we looked at annual performance were rebalanced annually. 
Uh, again, all of the data is from Dimension and it includes international and US. Let's um, stop there for one sec if we can, yes. Daryl, because yes. you brought up Dimensional. Um, not Maybe not everybody knows Dimensional, but they're a, a particular family of mutual funds and they're basically driven by academic research. And so they've developed these indexes. Can you give uh, our viewers and listeners a, a, an idea of the difference between a dimensional small cap value or one of those asset classes and, and using Russell or, or some other uh, index that represents a similar asset class, but not exactly the same? Yeah, we had a question on how the indexes were formed. And if we go back here, here's how the indexes were formed. This is right off the dimensional site, and it talks about how they uh, compose their large cap value index. We have them for small cap value and also the small cap. Those were the particular ones that were asked for. But it talks about how they developed the index, what is in it, what's not in it, and where they got the data, and then how they went through and uh, calculated their returns down here. You, this is for those who are listening to the podcast, you, you'll have to come to the site, paulmerriman.com and look at these. We'll have to put these up, Paul. Yep. Um, and it's, and even if you're looking at it on, on a, the uh, video, it's, it's hard to read, but they will be there. And, and the difference is that uh, they constructed these indexes based on their academic understanding of what they were trying to accomplish with these different factors or asset classes. So they're very, very valuey or very small uh, relative to some of the other ones. Um, and, and Chris can maybe talk about fact factors at some point uh, later on maybe and how that might work. Um, and, and in a sense, it seems fair as long as everybody's portfolio was using the same underlying asset classes. While it might not be exactly the way that an individual investor will access those for the purposes of trying to see relative risk and return, uh, it seemed like it was a, a fair way to go. And didn't that also have to do with how far back we could go with indexes? Right, right. because we were using, uh, I, I, what I wanted to do was have data from a consistent source of, of uh, returns and that returns were from the dimensional database. And the, the dimensional database only went back to 1990 for a couple of the, of the uh, asset classes. My phone's right. going off over here, sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and let's see, where was it? Oh, just yeah, about. And the ones in particular were the international large cap value and a global market from, from dimensional that only went back to 1990. Now it's possible that in the future we can go back to go back further to 1970 or even further than that, possibly in some cases, and uh, and we could expand the the work done then uh, by by looking at further further uh, further back into history. Okay, I think we talked about this how how the indexes are just they have no implementation expenses other than some expense ratios that I've added but the in, but the normal funds have all kinds of expenses and also other costs associated with them so that well, just and to be fair you know, when people think that they get uh, the index return less a small expense someday you ought to go look at morningstar and look up the vanguard index funds right. and see the past result how different, sometimes over a percent a year, how different the returns of the funds are compared to the index itself. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's trickier when you have to manage the money than just simply saying, I own an index because money flows in and out and that all has to be managed and sometimes it doesn't exactly uh, match that particular index. Right. So that's those are kind of the portfolios. Why they were, how they were constructed, why they were constructed the way they were, uh, and which ones we looked at. Um, one of the things that we did when when in doing this analysis was to try to get a feel for risk, and in order to do that, we looked at that risk landscape in in several different ways. 
uh, in terms of, of parameters that we could calculate or analyze. In terms of portfolio performance, return performance, we looked at standard deviations, both ups, up and down, the normal, normal standard deviation definition, and then also the downside standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation measures volatility. Most people, I don't think, care about volatility too much when you're up. They do care when you're down. And so those are two different measures that are, are good to look at. We also looked at maximum drawdowns over different periods of time. And then risk adjusted returns, a sharp ratio, which looks at total volatility, takes into account return with using total volatility. And the Sortino ratio, which also takes into account return uh, volatility, but only on the downside. And when we're looking at withdrawal sequences or withdrawal scenarios, we look at, at the, the so-called sustainable or safe withdrawal rates um, over a 30 year typically is what we use here, time horizon and whether the portfolio failed uh, for a given uh, withdrawal rate, say 4%. Um, the other thing we looked at this time uh, was the telltale chart. And so, and that did generate a lot of questions. What's a telltale chart? Well, a telltale chart is, is a, I don't know if John Bogle invented it, but he certainly popularized it. Um, and what it does is it compares one security with another security. Um, it, it, it's also known as a price relative or a relative strength chart. And it does this by dividing the return of the benchmark into the return of the security that you're, you're looking at or that you're, is under consideration. Um, and so it takes the aggregate growth of one asset, the benchmark, divides it into the aggregate growth of the other asset that you're looking at. Uh, I think that's what I, I think that that's what this is. It, it's stated the other way around here, but that's, that's really what it's doing. And uh, so it normalizes the performance really. And it gives you some insight about what happens, like Paul mentioned in terms of how, how long, how does the performance of the two vary over time relative to each other? And how, how long sometimes does it take for this performance uh, to, to resolve itself or regress to the mean, if you want to think of it that way? Um, or, or whatever. Uh, this, this is uh, also this definition here came basically from the Bogleheads Wiki, which, where they discuss the telltale chart. So here is an example of the telltale chart and the growth chart. On the left is the the traditional growth chart. You start out with a dollar down here on January 1, 1930, and at the end of 90 years. You're up here at, oh, what is that? That's about almost $30,000 with the US four fund portfolio. And you're down here, I'm not sure what that is. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, yeah, 50 60, somewhere in there, $1,000 here. The important point here is that as you look at how Actually, these- that's, that's not 60,000. You were, uh, the second one, 6,000, right? Yeah, that looks right. Yeah, so the well, S&P 500 grew to like 30,000 and, or I mean, the S&P 500 grew to 3,000, 4,000, something like that. And the four fund grew to 30,000-ish, right? Yeah, it looks like it's in the mid 20s. Yeah, yeah. But see, this is actually part of the problem with the growth chart, unless you have the numbers on it. It's, and it's on a log scale, which shows changes in a, in a relative sense. Um, from one, one main line to another is a factor of 10, no matter where it occurs on this chart. The other thing is that it's also hard to tell when one is doing better than the other. What you're really looking at is the gap between these two lines. It's hard to tell what it is. So when you divide the two, when you divide the uh, small cap or the US uh, four fund by the S&P 500, and you get the ratio of how well the four fund did relative to the S&P 500, that's what the chart on the right shows. It shows the relative strength. And, and over the 90, 90 years, here this is one, two, three, four, almost five. Yeah. It's grown almost five times as much over the 92 years as the S&P 500. Was not a smooth ride, as you can see. Here, for example, things didn't go, not, nothing really happened very much in here. And then all of a sudden here you shot up. Here you shot up, 
here you didn't shoot up, you went down. So here's another great one here, and here's another down and a down, and you can really see those differences. And, and uh, it's, it's important to understand where those occur and how they occur when you're trying to understand how long you have to wait or how big the, the benefits, how long you've had to wait, I should say, in the past. And let's make sure that um, we, under, we understand that this is all about the outperformance of one asset over the other because the, the primary asset, the S&P 500, could have a great 50 years and the other one could be small cap value and it produces exactly the same amount. Well, it had a great 50 years as well, but we paid it to give us more and we didn't get it. And that's where people, I think, get antsy is when they go through these long periods of waiting to get that extra mm -hmm. return. And of course, as we know right now, there are also times when you're underperforming whatever that, uh, that major asset class is which of course is reflected here on every time that the, uh, that the value went down. Right. Didn't, didn't mean you were losing money. You were just not making as much. Right. That, that's a good point. Um, this, this, let's take, for example, I have no idea if this is true, but let's take this example right here of this up, up sweep here. This, this means that the gap between the two is getting larger because the ratio of the top to the bottom is getting larger. So what it means is the four fund is outperforming the S&P 500. That doesn't mean they're both going up. They both could be going down. The S&P could just be going down more faster. Exactly. But you would still be happier to be in the four fund than the S&P if that were the case. Yeah. Uh, and vice versa over here when you have a down, a downtrend like this. So there was one question that said, when they looked at the telltale chart, they didn't see the S&P on there. Well, the S&P is implicit in this chart because it's the benchmark that the four fund is measured against here. Or and put so, another way, Daryl, if the S&P was on the chart, it would be a line straight across at the number one, right? Sure. If you took, if you took the S&P 500 and divided it by the benchmark, which is the S&P 500, yep. it would be right here, straight along the bottom here. Right. Good point, Chris. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think, oh, yeah, somebody had a question about the quilts charts. I think that's an interesting name for this, the quilt chart. Um, they, they were wondering uh, what the lessons were on the quilt chart. And I think when you look at this here, this is for the, this is in decades, performance decades, decade or performance by decades. You can see that they sort of bounce all over the place. Um, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're not good. Sometimes you're good, sometimes you're not good. And so one of the lessons from this quilt chart, well, even what were you What were you pointing at there when you said sometimes you're good? And well, sometimes small cap value is good here. In the, you, uh, can, you, can you see my arrow here? I can now, yeah. Okay. Sometimes uh, small cap value is good. Sometimes it's not so good. It wasn't so good in the 30s. Sometimes the S&P is good, like it, like the, uh, the 2010 through the 2019 decade. Sometimes it's not, like the 20 through the 2010 decade. And, uh, and that happens a lot. If you look at this and in, 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 in study it, you can see things bounce around a lot. The one that doesn't really bounce around too much is the four fund, which sort of makes sense because it's an average of these four things. So it's always going to be in the middle somewhere. But this, this looks at by decades and, and it bounces around by decade. But if you look at it by year, and we're just looking at the four equity classes now, it's even crazier. Okay. Um, and so to try to, one of the lessons I get out of this, a quilt chart like this is that you know, one, two, three, five, ten years, ten years here, this is a ten year chart, is not really long term. Uh, and so that's an important lesson that came out of the quilt charts. Now, um, I got really excited when I saw this because um, it, it, it looks at every year going back to 1928, it shows the four major asset classes 
and it shows the combination of the four. And I thought it was fascinating uh, as an investor to see periods where the S&P 500 is the best for four or five years. And then shortly thereafter, it's the worst for seven years. And then it's up at the, and, and, and so you're all over the place, any of these individual asset classes, but the four fund strategy, and to me, this is such a powerful lesson. The four fund strategy, it isn't in the middle all the time, but it is in the middle most of the time. And the reason that that's important is because the other three assets beside the S&P 500 are all historically more profitable long-term than the S&P 500. So it, it, in fact, we had this question about, about what, what's the, what strategy, what asset class would you take if you wanted to count on this money in the equity part of your portfolio, uh, in terms of, of what's the term? You know what I'm looking for, Chris. Um, the, the, the series, the series of returns. Oh, the sequence, sequence of sequence returns. Sequence of returns. Thank yeah, we'll you. Talk, we'll hate talk you. about that later. I have a whole whole thing okay, on. Okay, I, I'll shut up. Well, no, no, it's fine. Um, but you're making my point. Yeah. Or we'll see your, well, let me put it differently. We'll see your point again later. Um, and, and I think people, you may have a hard time seeing it right now, but we're going to be sure to have uh, yeah. this available through our site. You're going to have fun looking at this. It, there are a million lessons on that page. Yeah. Th these two trees, two call, two so-called quilt charts here are hard to, hard to talk about when you're not actually looking at it. Uh, so you'll have to you'll have to come to the site to take a look at it. Um, oh, and then here's here's what Paul was just talking about, um, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the sequence of returns. This is a chart that just shows the four fund and the S and P five hundred. Um, let's see. So some of the key lessons that we we looked at and, uh, and that came out of this was risk and reward about which portfolio had the had the best returns. Um, how, how about risk and reward or, or reward for risk? Uh, if you look at the S&P 500 here, the for, uh, portfolio, it had a compound average growth rate over the 30-year period of 10. Um, two of the three fund portfolios did significantly better, what I am percent and a half or almost two and a half percent uh, better. And that was the total U.S. plus 30 percent small cap value and the uh, all, ver all uh, value, you, all US value, the small cap, small cap value and large cap value US had a 12.3% return. Um, if you look at the three fund and the four fund, um, you can see that the, the four funds of the four funds, the US only uh, four fund and the all world, all value uh, four fund, both did a percent to almost 2% better than the S&P. So that over this 30 year period, those, those funds, those portfolios would have done better than the S&P. If we go back and look at reward for risk, okay, either in terms of the Sharpe ratio, which looks at uh, your reward as a function of total volatility or the Sortino, which looks at your reward as a function of downside volatility, um, they're the, those same differences uh, held. The, the portfolios that had the higher returns gave you more return for unit risk. Um, the, the Sharpe ratio for the S&P was about 0.49. For the total U.S. 30% tilt and the all value, they were about 0.55, which is more. Is it significantly more? Maybe yes, maybe no. But when you look at Sortino, which only considers downside volatility, the, the uh, S&P was 1.08 in the 30% in U.S. with the all value, with a 30% total U.S. with a 30% small cap value tilt was 1.36 and the all value is 1.438, almost 1.4. That's 30, 40% better. So that's probably a significant difference to me. So, um, so people wrote to us 
and they wanted to know whether we thought this was going to happen again. I mean, that is, that is what investors would like to know because who wouldn't right. want to pick up that extra return and, and, unless the risk is just out of the question. And I did not see anywhere just looking at the risk intuitively that I would have said, no, nah, I'm not going there because the, the risk is obviously too high. Did either one of you see any risk that you that you thought would would scare you away from any of these no nonsense portfolios? Well, there's one here that that really did not do well at all, and that was the total world. Okay, it had a it had a 7.3 return versus 10. Its sharp ratio was almost a third less. Uh, than than the S and P 0.34 versus 0.49, and its Sortino was 30 percent less than than the S and P 500. Now you got to remember what the what the total world is. It's it's you know it's cap weighted, but it's essentially almost half international. International did not do well over these last 30 years, and so that hinges on whether or not you think you should have international in your portfolio. And we'll talk a lot about that later on. Um, but to get back to the, the reward for the risk, if we go and look at the four fund portfolios here, um, again, the, the sharp ratio of the US four fund is a little better than the sharp ratio of the S&P 0.56 versus 0.49. The all value, all world portfolio is essentially the same, 0.51 versus 0.49. But if you look at the downside risk, the Sortino ratio, the reward for your downside volatility, again, the S&P was 1.08 and the US four fund is 1.37. That's, to me, that's significantly higher. That's about 30% higher. The all world was about, all world, all value was about 1.17. So it's a little better, is it? significantly better. Yeah. It's hard to say where, where significance starts to arise. But uh, so those are the, to me, those are the three or four portfolios that come out of it. So Chris, before we leave these tables, would you want to add anything that? I, yeah, the biggest thing I would say, and uh, Daryl mentioned it as well, is that over these 30 years, uh, international didn't perform particularly well. And next month in the AAII webinar I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, go back to 1970. And I think that'll give us a chance to see a different period of time where the difference between worldwide or international and U.S. was much closer. Um, so uh, I think I think that the analysis that uh, you covered in this last webinar uh, really did a good job of showing that investors have historically been rewarded for using small and value in their portfolio. And I think that's something that is going to be consistent when I go back to 1970 as well. It's, th those are observations that have stood the test of time. Um, I think the... Um, uh, the observation, though, that the U.S. outperformed worldwide, I'm not as comfortable with. I, I think that that's just a quirk of the, the timeline that we had. Mm -hmm. And so I'd encourage people who are grappling with it, hey, well, how, how much international diversification should I have? And is it going to improve or hurt my performance? I'd encourage them to look at the webinar I do next month because that'll give them another data point that covers a little bit wider range of time. And I think will uh, help reinforce the idea that international diversification is a good thing. And I think that date that you present is October uh, 21st, right? Uh, yeah, I, I said next month, but you're right. It's this month. It's October 21st. And by the way, you, you, you have a brand new article that came out today uh, in the AAII Journal. Yeah, there. it talks it talks about, uh, it does, and it talks about how uh, we have to pay a price to be different and what that price is. So when we invest in something like the four fund strategy, instead of the S&P 500, there are a number of things we as investors have to do to earn that premium. And we're gonna talk about some of them in the, the, uh, the rest of this podcast, but great. they're also covered to some extent in that article. Okay, it's great. If you, so, if you, 
Invest to be different. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised when you are. That's right. <laughs> That's a hard thing for people to get. Yeah. Because when we buy something, we buy it because it's been good. And then, and then we, this difference between the courtship, the honeymoon and reality, those are, can be three very different uh, views of, of life and, a lot of investors just don't get that. Go, I, I, I love this one. Yeah, I wanted to, to clarify something. You, th this, is a, this is a lesson about patience here, right? And so when we uh, briefed this chart or Paul briefed this chart in, during his presentation, we talked about these long flat lines here and we said those are periods of relative underperformance. And, and we've got well, some people who can't see that chart. Could you just give a an idea of how long those sure. were? Well, the first thing is with the, the periods of time we're talking about, they run anywhere from eight years up to 20 years. But the point I wanted to make about this is we, on the chart, we called them duration of relative underperformance. And it wasn't really relative underperformance. It's duration until you break even, until you get back to where you were. And so if you think about that, what that means is you had a period of underperformance, but then you had to have a period of outperformance to get back. So every one of these sections, for example, that's eight years long, this, well, there's one of them here that's eight years long. Well, it actually went down for six years, but then it went up for, I don't know how many years after that. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like almost 10, but the first three or four of those were getting back to even. So, it's a subtlety, but there's the difference between breaking even and underperforming. And uh, I think if you have a chance to take a look, we'll see if we can put this up on the site. If you have a chance to take a look at this back up on the site, I think it'll help clarify some things. Um, it's, it's, the lesson is still the same. You have to be patient. Um, and it depends kind of where you hop on this roller coaster as to how long you have to be patient. Um, and whether you consider break even a period, waiting to break even a period of relative underperformance or not, <laughs> it depends kind of on where you choose to get on or get off the roller coaster. I recently uh, talked with a fellow who dumped Warren Buffett's stock. He'd held it for 10 years. He'd had enough. He dumped the Buffett stock, Berkshire Hathaway, and put all the money into Tesla. <laughs> There you go. Well, he probably did well for a while. Maybe that was his, well, I can't I mean, stand it anymore trade, right? Pardon? That was his I can't stand it anymore trade. That's exactly yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, unless you guys have anything else you want me to address, I think I'm kind of done with okay. the background okay. here. Um, the, there, there was a... Uh, so there were questions about these percentages in these different portfolios. And all we did was use the percentages that, that the creator of those strategies had, had, uh, had, had determined was the way to use them. We did not manipulate uh, or change their strategies. What you see is what they would want you to see uh, except with the exception, of course, of the, of the, uh, fixed income portion. So, so, and I think it's, um, as I look up my list of things that we're, we need to, to cover. Oh, I know rebalancing that came up quite a, quite a few times. Did you mention yeah. how often you rebalanced Daryl? Yes. We rebalanced annually. Okay. Okay. On and January 1. <laughs> we yeah. used annual returns to, to uh, for in terms of the return sequence. And, um, and and do you either one of you have any sense of how much less return we should have if we if we rebalance more often than if we balance less often? Uh, just a kind of a a general statement about that difference. I, in the end, in the analysis I've done in the past, it's usually on the order of 10 basis points. So, you know, like 0.1%. Uh, it's not a, whether you rebalance monthly, quarterly, yearly, 
yeah, it's it's a very small difference, um, not very big. I, now, if you go multiple years, you start to see um, more substantial differences in the, you'll see an increase in return because you're letting your winners run and you're basically letting your portfolio get tilted more towards the asset classes that outperform, but then you're also seeing your volatility grow, right? You're, you're getting out of whack with what you decided your own risk tolerance was. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the primary reason why you rebalance is because your, your asset allocation, your, your risk, your, you're outside your risk tolerance. Presumably you picked your allocation because you thought it was right for your risk tolerance. So uh, when you re choose to rebalance, that's why I use the 525 uh, Larry Swedro approach for rebalancing. I don't rebalance on a time schedule. I rebalance when it gets out of whack. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes that can be years. Uh, a lot of times it's years. <laughs> uh, the, the market bounces around a lot, but remember the asset allocation is a ratio of your equity to your, to your fixed income. And so you know, if everything is going down, your asset allocation is staying the same all the way down. So it's when things change that, that it's important. So anyway. And it's also, I think, important to understand that those tables were, in terms of the return money-wise, it, it assumed a $10,000 lump sum investment. Uh, it did not assume that you built the portfolio over a number of years. And so you'd have some very different kinds of returns based on dollar cost averaging. Uh, do you think the tables that you've built, Daryl, on accumulation, um, because we do have one of those on the four fund strategy and we do have one of those on S&P 500 and I think we have it with the all value, a slightly different all value uh, portfolio, but very close to what you have there. Do you think those are a good place to go get a sense of, of what sure. a regular monthly investor could have seen as, as opposed to starting with just $10,000? I gotta be smarter than my technology here and it's not working. So I had, uh, here we go. Here's, here's a fixed contribution schedule. Uh, it's one of a number of examples that we have. This one happens to be for the four fund combo. It's $1,000 a year um, and the, the uh, contributions are adjusted uh, for inflation. So this is kind of a dollar cost averaging approach. Um, they're actually, contributions are actually made monthly <clears throat> and rebalanced, I think, uh, I think it might've been rebalanced monthly in this example. Um, but this is an example of how your contributions can, can, uh, can vary as a function of your asset allocation uh, over this 50 year time frame. It's hard to read. Um, it, is, yeah, it is, but it does look at the bottom line is, this is 50 years that the four fund ends up with 4.1 million and the S&P 500 I think is, is two and that a two and a half million. Yeah, so, that's for a hundred hundred percent stock in the in the four fund, right? And I think the way you do these, Daryl, where you have also what would you have if you were fifty percent fixed income over that period of time? You would have had about a little under. Million. Yeah, so. Uh, People yeah. can, can, can go to our website and uh, look at a number of these kind of, of, of tables. So um, let's talk, if we could, if, if you guys don't have any other topics under the, the, the structure of these tables, which we had a lot of questions about, uh, I would love to discuss or respond to the, uh, the questions about uh, equity asset class selection because the one of the big differences between those columns on those tables is what equity asset class uh, you selected. And, uh, and already it's been brought up, but Chris, could you talk a little more about the international, about, about how much a person might have in international and 
And, and again, what's the payoff for international as it's been underperforming for some time now? Well, first of all, I, I think it's really important people um, do a gut check on how comfortable they are investing internationally, right? Um, so that, I think for a lot of people, that's going to frame, frame the discussion. And for some people, they'll just start with a, you know, a high comfort level and be willing to say, oh, I get diversification and, and that's good. And, and they'll be done. And, be, and they'll probably follow an academic recommendation of something like a 50-50 split between U.S. and international. Um, there's going to be other people, though, for whom, you know, they're worried about currency exchanges, you know, going up and down and losing money just because the U.S. dollar is out of favor and, um, you know, have a home com- country bias and, you know, be, be persuaded by a whole bunch of other things that they shouldn't diversify internationally. And, for that second group, I think it's really important for them to uh, appreciate some lessons from history, right? Um, so one of those lessons from history would be that if you went back and looked at the stock market in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the U.S. was not the superpower that it is today. Nobody would have predicted that from 1900 to 1999, that the U.S. would dominate that century in terms of its stock market returns. So, you know, to look back and say, oh, it's just obvious, you know, the U.S. is the market that you should be in because it's going to outperform is to neglect that nobody saw that coming before it happened. And nobody saw, you know, Japan's crash before it happened. Nobody saw Germany's crash before it happened or Russia's crash before it happened. So to the extent that you invest very heavily in any one country, you're taking a risk that the academics say you're not compensated for. Um, Now, does that mean that if you invest in the worldwide stock market today, that you're going to get a return as good as the U.S.? I I can't tell you that, right? Nobody really knows. It's possible the U.S. will outperform. But does it mean that you're taking less risk you're not compensated for if you enter if you invest more internationally absolutely so i i think it behooves most people to try and take a diversification as close to that recommended by the academics as close to the 50-50 as they can get now if they stop at a 70-30 that's 70% us um, and 30% international, they'll probably still, still get a lot of the benefit. And uh, when, we, when I do the next AAII webinar and we go back to 1970, I think what you'll see is that over that period of time, that 50-year period of time, there's very little difference between being 50-50 U.S. and international and being more heavily tilted towards the U.S., um, and I think if you go back to 1928, um, it tilts a little bit more back towards the U.S. being because the U.S. had a great century, right? Um, but but I think the truth is nobody knows moving forward. So so when when I choose for myself, my wife and I sit down and we talk about well how how international can we get before it becomes uncomfortable for you? Because I know that she starts with a home country bias. And so that, you know, we we try and nudge it in the direction of the academics, but we don't get all the way there and most people won't. Well, and John Bogle, he he put a cap of 20% on international. And that was his his comfort level, I think. as you've pointed out, he did really well with a U.S. asset class, the S&P 500. That's the horse he rode into town on. That's right. Right? As you, you've described it that way. So why wouldn't he stay U.S. focused? Yeah. yeah. Daryl, you started to say something? No, I just I just happened to have his book handy here where he said that. Oh, I see. Okay. Great. Right? It's that's great. So that's his, his little book of common sense investing. Yes, I have that. Mine, mine had, uh, I've got it right behind me. It is so worn. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it really is a must for a young investor or, or somebody just getting started uh, to, to, to read. Um, so on the um, asset class selection, value, of course, is the big, is 
the thing that's been underperforming recently has outperformed, whether it's small value or large value. Uh, so, so Chris, you're building your two funds for life, and you're going to be talking about that on October 21st, I assume. Yeah. Um, what's your, your, your belief about the future of small cap value or value in general? Well, I, I think um, I like to buy things that are on sale. I, you know, I like to buy things that are cheaper and get value for my money. Um, when I'm investing in the stock market, I'm not just buying some, you know, random kind of bucket in hopes that it goes up in value. I'm, I'm not speculating. I'm buying earnings. I'm buying future earnings and I can buy more of them per dollar in the value category than I can in the growth category. And so my belief is that over time, um, that that's going to pay off. It's going to um, be a better deal. And I, I, so I think there's just a good underlying financial reason for it to have a better return in the long run. But I also believe from the work that Daryl just did that I'm going to have to wait for that. I'm going to have to recognize that I'm contrarian. And I think all investors are going to have to do that. They're going to have to understand that because you're investing in the thing that's not popular, you shouldn't expect it just to go up tomorrow, right? It may take a little while for the rest of the world to appreciate it. And some of the things in that category are going to do poorly, right? Some of those companies will go out of business. They're cheap for a reason. Yeah. But on average, um, history says that that's a, a, a way to get a premium, a way to get a little better return. And if I can combine it with another premium that has good historical results, the size premium, then that even increases my chances of success more. So I think, I think if investors can understand the reasons for it and then provide the behavior that helps them earn the return, they'll do well investing in value. But it may not be tomorrow. It may take five or 10 years before that, that premium comes back. And that's what Daryl's charts show is that sometimes you have to wait a long time. And in, in fact, uh, looking at the four fund strategy, not just a small cap value, but with the four fund strategy over that 90 years in that uh, telltale uh, chart, um, 70 and a half years, you were in essence behind the premium you expected. Yeah. You were waiting to break even out of 90 years. And so that difference between the and, and the four fund strategy is impacted a lot by that small cap value, that 25% position. Uh, it, 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 it happened in very short spurts that maybe just went for a, a few years. In fact, Daryl, do you have uh, uh, any actual number of years that those, uh, well, it must have been the difference between the 70 and a half that you were behind uh, and the 90. So about 20 years out of the 70 really produced that premium as I, as I see it. So, so what about Chris, uh, maybe one of you has done something with this, the, the growth people, a lot of people wrote in, where is the growth? Where is the beef? Um, what do you, what do you, what do you say to people who say, who, who do not see growth in these portfolios. There, some of these portfolios. there was a question about how small cap value had underperformed large cap growth. 48%. Yeah, and, and they, were, uh, they were concerned that how long would they, let me see if I can find it here actually. Yeah, they, the gap between large cap growth and small cap value for the last one year has been just horrible. 46.5% according to Morningstar. Won't it take a long, long time to recover? Could be 10 plus years. Well, there's, uh, there's a couple of things there. Um, I went and I found the, found the Morningstar article and the number that was quoted, 46.3% actually is the number that I see in, in the article, is the underperformance of small cap value relative to small cap growth. Mm. Um, because they were comparing value and growth in the different size categories. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I went back and looked at what was it relative to large cap value. 
<clears throat> or large cap growth rather. And let me see if I can find it here. So <clears throat> here are the rolling three-year cumulative returns, which is what the Morningstar article looked at. Of small cap growth or small cap value minus large cap growth. And here's your minus 41.4%. So it's this goes back to 1975. This goes back to 1975. Yeah. Okay. And uh, here's the 40 plus, 40 plus percent underperformance that the questioner was, was concerned about. Yeah. So you can see that, that these kinds of numbers have happened before in the past. And so how long did it take the rolling three year return to get back to zero? About two years, uh -huh. not 10 years. Yeah, in all three, three in, cases. In, where in all three years. cases that have happened since 1920. The, the flip side was kind of interesting too. I looked at how did large cap growth outperform small cap value, uh, large, cap, large cap growth minus small cap value. And so in 1977 here, the three-year rolling return of large cap growth minus small cap value was a minus 72%. Growth was down 72% compared to small cap value. Large cap growth was down 72%. And it took more than eight years to get even. In 1996, large cap growth was down 48% relative to small cap value. It took two years to get even. In 2003, it was down 70, almost 72% again. It took more than three years, almost four years, to get even with small cap value. Same thing in, in 2010, it was down 30%, and it took a little over three years to get back. So what's the message here? I think the message to me that I get out of this is, yeah, these asset classes can outperform each other by large amounts over rolling three-year periods, and it happens regularly. Uh, and so it's not a surprise. The thing that I find interesting is that when small cap value is down by a lot in the past, what is this, 45 years? When that has happened, it has come back quickly. Mm -hmm. Large cap growth, when it's down by a lot relative to small cap value, takes longer to come back. I, I think yeah. the other thing- Let me phrase that differently has taken longer to come back in the past. Yeah, Nobody the other thing I the Sorry, the other thing that I see that's different on the chart here is the peaks, the, you know, how much did it outperform? Um, so small cap values peaks in terms of outperformance are up around 75%, 125%, 50% uh, right. and large cap growths outperformance is 25%, 50%. You know, it's consider it's quite a bit lower, um, which is what we would expect, right? We would expect that over the long haul, if you if you look at the cumulative effect of the gain of large cap growth versus small cap value, it would be smaller. That small cap value should outperform over the long haul and has. These charts make it hard to see that, but but it's kind of hidden in there, right? Yeah. The other thing is these charts are essentially mirror images of each other. They don't look quite like it because you're talking about ratios, right? Right. But they are. This peak here that Chris pointed out where small cap right. small cap value was up over 125, it's the same peak here where or trough where large cap growth right. was down. Yeah. Um, they, they don't, the numbers aren't. Yeah, they're mirror the images. Ratios right. work, but yeah. But so this so this is interesting to me because what this tells me is that that uh, one is it probably won't take 10 years, it has not taken 10 years in the past. So if that's a guide. Um, and also that uh, when this inevitably flips and goes the other way, growth takes a lot longer to come back to even than value did when it was down. And while we're on value, particularly small cap value, um, we had a question about if I'm young, should I be putting all of my money in small cap value? Chris, why don't you uh, take that since you have become an expert on small cap value? Well, and I've, I've modeled it a lot of different ways, right? I've, I've modeled uh, 
putting somebody in all small cap value and staying there. I've modeled putting somebody in small cap value as part of the two fund for life strategy where, where they're a hundred percent small cap value up until age 25 and then ramp it down towards retirement or they do the one and a half times age, which means that, you know, at, at 20, you've got 30% in a target date fund and 70% in small cap value and you ramp it down. So I've, I've looked at all those different approaches and, two things stand out. Uh, first of all, the more you tilt towards small in value, the more you put at risk in the short term, right? The more, so the, the, more, the deeper the drawdown could be. So let's say you're a young investor and you put everything in small cap value and then two years later you decide you need to buy a house. And now you don't have as much money as you had the day you put it in because small cap value is out of favor right now in the marketplace. Well, you took more risk, you have less money, you may not be in as good a position to buy a house. And that, that disadvantage lasts for five to 10 years. You have more money at risk for at least five to 10 years. So, so for a young investor who's thinking about tilting towards small in value, they should probably also be thinking, well, do I have a down payment for a house that I'm going to have to be putting up? Do I, do I have a debt, a school debt that I need to be paying down? Do I have other short-term needs, an emergency fund that I need to save, right? There are other things that I would not put small cap value in because they're not a long-term investment. So let's say that those are taken care of. Now you're just talking about saving for retirement. Um, in general, if you can tolerate the volatility, that's the next big choice. If you can stick with it through thick and thin, the more you put into small cap value, the higher your expected median end return will be, right? But you're going to have to maybe go through 10 or 15 years where you underperform the S&P 500. Do you believe in it enough to do that, right? Right. Now, I think somebody who takes the one and a half times their salary into target date fund and the rest into small cap value and ramps it down over time, or somebody who takes 10% of their savings and puts it in small cap value, I think they're going to weather that storm just fine because they're diversified. And the fact that small cap value is out of favor is a small part of their whole portfolio. But for somebody who's got a big chunk in that one asset class and runs through a period of bad returns, I, I think they're putting themselves at risk for second guessing and getting out of it at the wrong time and then not earning the premium. So, so you have to know yourself. You have to know how much of that downside are you going to be able to tolerate and how confident are you in the returns? Because when it gets really, really hard, you're going to be tested and you're going to have to stick with it to get those premiums, right? So as much as I've studied it and as much as I believe in it, I don't have everything in small cap value. Um, you know, I, I have a small part of our portfolio in small cap value because I want that extra premium, but I also don't want to lose sleep at night if I go through 10 years without it. Yes. And, and somebody asked about how I invest personally, and uh, I'm in the equity portion of the buy and hold portion. Uh, my wife and I have half of our equities in small, half in large. We have half of our small in value and half in blend. And we have to remember that part of the blend is value. Yep. So we have more than half of that small in value. Um, we have uh, half in U.S. and half in international. And then we really irritate people when we tell them that we have half in buy and hold and half in market timing. Uh, I've, I've, for me, I've tried to invest with every kind of diversification that I can that implies that I should get a decent return. I'm at the point in my life where big returns are not my concern not losing a lot of money is uh, is is what I'm more concerned about, and uh, so this this is why the three of us can talk and talk and talk, uh, and at the end of the day, it's hard to solve problems for people because we don't know the specifics. As a matter of fact, 
I was just checking today because I know the answer for myself, but I wasn't sure for Daryl and Chris. But I asked, are, do, any of, uh, do either one of you have a designation as a certified financial planner? I don't. Do no, any, I don't. Is, any, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is anybody here a chartered financial analyst? <laughs> no way. No some way. guy on the internet. Is, that, <laughs> is anybody here qualified about, about like a CPA? Anybody got a CPA? No. And so this is one of the genuinely interesting things about investing. Anybody can step up and place a bet and the market will do what it's going to do. And, uh, it, but it does beg the question, for those of us who are do-it-yourself investors, which I'm actually not, but I'm trying to help do-it-yourself investors, is how much do we need to know in order to make the right decision. And I think, Chris, what you just said is we need to know ourselves. We need to understand if we're young yes. and small cap values in decline, that's good. That's not bad because it means that your dollar cost averaging is buying more shares. But boy, when it's happening to you, it doesn't feel that way. And that's, that's why investing, I think, is, is difficult. You know what I think? I think we've been talking for about an hour. Does anybody have an idea if that's about right? I think it's so. About right. Sounds about right. And when we, we started this, we said, okay, we don't want to wear them out. Let's go 45 minutes to an hour and then come back to fight another day. Now, um, are you up to it? Come back and do this another day and continue these questions? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right. Yeah. I mean, we could go eight hours right now. No. No, we couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I do. I, I, I really do appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to do this. And you know, my hope, I don't know how you feel about it, but if we talk here for an hour and some young investor or somebody who's getting close to retirement is trying to solve some problem and out of our conversation comes a potential answer. I, I, I hope, I hope we're helping somebody uh, make some important decisions. So thank you both. And, uh, and thank all of the viewers and the listeners. Uh, we'll be back for more in answering those AAII questions. And go to your calendar, please, and put down uh, Chris Patterson, AAII, October 21. I know it's 530 on the Pacific Coast. And, uh, and you can go to AAII and, uh, and, and, and sign up for that. Uh, for that. But what, it's an hour and a half or so, including questions. Chris? I'll, I'll probably try and do my presentation in 45 minutes and okay. leave time for questions, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's, I, I think uh, we have about an hour and a half window. Yeah. That's great. Well, these, just for what it's worth, these two people volunteer to help other investors hundreds and hundreds of hours a year. And I can't even start to tell you how much I appreciate it. And I hope you do too. We will see you hopefully next week. Thank you for joining us.